I'm Mike Manier. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Salmon Matter. There is a major landslide that has caused an obstruction in the upper Fraser River at the Big Bar location not far from Kamloops that's keeping many of our Pacific salmon stocks from being able to return to their uh, natal streams and rivers to spawn. Here to tell us more about the ongoing effort to clear that obstruction is Gwil Roberts. He's the director of the Big Bar Landslide Response Team with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and he's joining us today from his home office in Victoria. Gwil, thanks for joining us. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, thank you for joining us, and I know you've been working hard uh, with lots of folks for many months. We're, we're very excited to get into the details here. You've made a lot of progress. Gwil, why don't you start by telling those that are watching a little bit of background. You know, first of all, where is Big Bar exactly? And when do you think this uh, landslide occurred and, and how do you think it occurred? So the Big Bar landslide is approximately 60 kilometers uh, due north of Lillooet. So as the crow flies about 60 kilometers, uh, it's about 100 kilometers uh, along the, the West Pavilion Road there. Um, and if you were heading up uh, from the, the mouth of the Fraser to the Big Bar slide, that would be about uh, 365 kilometers from the from the mouth of the Fraser. Um, the slide itself was discovered at the end of June in 2018. Uh, we believe the slide happened in approximately November, October, November of 2018. But it wasn't discovered um, until uh, until the summer of 2019, mainly because it's a, a very remote region of the province. There, uh, not many people are living in that area, um, and uh, the slide happened at uh, relatively low water. So there wasn't an indication on of, of any major change in river flows or or volumes um, to to provide us uh, uh, any clues. Yeah, this is in a very remote location, isn't it, Quill? That's correct. So uh, you're, you know, the 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 nearest town, um, well, to the south is Lillooet, uh, to uh, to the east is Clinton. Um, you're at least an hour, an hour and a half by by gravel road to uh, to the vicinity. Um, you need to cross the the Fraser if you're coming from from the Clinton area. Uh, you know, this is this is traditional ranch uh, country. This is the Caribou, um, and uh, it uh, it is uh, it is an area that uh, that has very little infrastructure. Um, that uh, you know, some some roads, and and that's really about it. So, who actually discovered the landslide, the obstruction? So the the. Discovery happened uh, through a, a local landowner. Uh, so he was informed by actually a rafting operation that was surveying the river and, and looking to, to raft the river. And uh, so that information was passed to the landowner. The landowner contacted uh, Fisheries and Oceans. And uh, we immediately sent crews out uh, by helicopter to have a look to see what was going on. So there was uh, uh, representatives from uh, the federal government, from the provinci provincial government, and from First Nations that uh, that reviewed this, the, the slide area and, and, and immediately realized that this was a major impact to, uh, to, to the river. And uh, also a major impact on salmon, as we have learned. Give us a sense uh, from the Fisheries and Oceans Canada perspective, how serious of an issue is this for the many Pacific salmon stocks that have to go through that area? What's the big picture relative to, to salmon? Well, the slide itself um, and its location on the Fraser, it has 100% blocked the passage of salmon. So uh, at certain flow levels. Um, now, what we observed in 2019 uh, was that uh, any any flows, and we, we measure flows here in, in cubic meters per second, uh, any river flows that were above, say, the, the 3,000 or the 3,500 um, cubic meters per second flow rate were stopping salmon from, from migrating over, over the, 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 the slide site. Uh, some salmon were able to get across on, on their own effort uh, in, in August and into September uh, and beyond because water levels were dropping, but certainly any salmon arriving from May through to August were being stopped and were, uh, you know, many of those, or the, the, mass, the vast majority of those salmon uh, were dying. There was high mortality rate. Um, so 
that was the the initial response was to to uh, realize the 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 magnitude of the problem and then put measures in place to try and move those salmon through uh, a couple of different means across the slide site. Um, what does that mean overall? Well, this is a, an extreme threat to the salmon population. Um, any any salmon that migrate uh, north of this area, and there are many, many um, salmon bearing streams um, you know, the salmon are moving up to Stewart Lake to uh, Chilco system. Um, there, uh, there are many tributaries and salmon bearing streams, as I mentioned, that uh, that would be devoid of salmon um, uh, if, if uh, the slide is not uh, remediated, it's, if it's not cleared. Yeah, and it was not a great news story last year in terms of uh the number of salmon that were actually able to return to their 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 natal streams, but of course it was not uh, uh, certainly wasn't because of there weren't Herculean efforts. You you all worked very hard last year. Tell us a little bit about what you did last year to move those fish to help them to try to get home to spawn. So the the response last year, what was set up was was what we call an incident command uh, system or or response, and that that. Uh, the idea there was, uh, again, it was a joint uh, operation between the province, uh, the federal government, and, uh, and First Nations. Um, what happened was a uh, camp was set up. Uh, there were crews that were working from Lillooet, and we tried, following the assessment of the, uh, the block, um, we immediately mobilized crews to the area. So within a week of discovering the, the block, we were on site uh, developing a plan. And what, what precipitated from there was salmon that couldn't get across the, the, the slide on their own. They were gathered, they were, um, we, they were netted, and they were put into tanks, and they were moved by helicopter, uh, and some were moved by, by truck as well. So that was the, the measures that were, those were the measures available to us last summer. Um, Again, we're, they were moving damaged fish, fish that were injured, fish that had been at the slide site for uh, maybe a couple of months and had been consistently trying to move over the slide and, and get to the other side. So they were they were tired, and as a result, even through even though we were able to to transport um, a, a fair number of them across the slide site, there was still high mortality for those fish. So it was a very bad year last year. Yeah, fish generally don't like being trucked and helicoptered. So uh, if they'd been That's holding right. there for many weeks and then you have to do this extra stress on top of it, it was uh, an against all odds sort of effort. Okay, so give us a sense, Gwil, that was last year. Let's sort of fast forward. We wanna learn more about what you've been doing since then. There's been a lot of progress made, I understand. Uh, but but before we do that, when will the Pacific salmon that are gonna be migrate, migrating naturally through this obstruction, when do they start returning to that area this year? So we're expecting the first salmon to arrive uh, actually very soon um, towards, uh, you know, within the next week or so, uh, within the next two weeks. So by the end of May, uh, we will ha have uh, a, a number of fish uh, arriving at the, at the slide site. Okay. And you've been working, uh, it's been over a year now, if I recall, that, that this started. Let's get into now a little bit of detail about uh, the various solutions that you've had to come up with to try to uh, fix this problem. Can you walk us through uh, what you're what you're doing and 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 how that's working? The first the first step here um, was to you know, following following what 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 the work that that happened in 2019 um, was to get a, a, an industrial heavy equipment operator onto the site uh, to try and remove as much rock from the area. So that was what we call a remediation effort. Um, a contract was tendered and uh, and awarded to Peter Kewitt's sons, ULC. So uh, a very large, competent and, and highly resourced uh, a company. Mm -hmm. They were, they immediately mobilized to the site. Uh, they had trucks and equipment um, up at Big Bar in uh, by mid January. And they worked really hard, really diligently to get access to the slide site. So with that remoteness, with that isolation of the, the, the of the landslide area, there's no road access to the slide. And wow. 
installing a road was the was certainly one of the um, the first priorities. So in order to do that, they were running. Uh, there was some tracks, and they were able to to get you know within a couple of kilometers of the slide site. But then a, a road building um, uh, exercise and a road building operation uh, began. That meant. Uh, overcoming some extreme obstacles as well because there is a high point uh, what we now refer to as the razorback and in order to punch a road through to the slide site they had to build the road over top of this razorback and that required a, a tremendous amount of drilling and blasting to uh, to re reduce the uh, the elevation of that razorback so you could get a, a usable road grade uh, installed so uh, about 32 meters of height was reduced at the razorback through drilling and blasting we, wow. we basically put a, a pass through this fin um, and then the road then we, the road had to be built on the other side down to the slide area um, and again now you're dealing with a, another steep grade and we're up against a, a, a canyon you know you're basically up against a canyon wall as well so and this is all road, just to get started on actually working on the obstruction that's correct yes and that wasn't uh the, there were multiple concurrent activities happening there as well okay. so uh the road was being built uh, at the same time, they were lowering an excavator down uh, one of the canyon walls uh, to to facilitate and, and expedite that road production, that road uh, construction. Um, they were also uh, planning and and uh, drilling what we call the east toe. So the east toe is a rock outcropping that extends on the east side of the river, and uh, right. it's a naturally formed. Uh, constriction point. So this slide could not have, well, it, it happened at a very bad spot because the, the canyon there was already constricted and then the, the rock slide just made things that much worse. So one of the plans that were generated was to remove that that outcropping and that required basically um, on the east side of the riverbank, there is no road access uh, and it is a very steep grade. Wow. And the only way to move crews in there was by helicopter. So every day through the winter um, in uh, in some very formidable weather, you know, we're talking about the caribou in winter, it's, it's you're easily reaching negative 30 degrees uh, Celsius and crews were dropped off. They would be then, they would then rappel down to the east toe where they would have drilling equipment and they would drill all day long and, uh, and prepare charges. So that piece was also ongoing. And, and as you probably know, the East Toe was blasted on two, two different uh, occasions that East Toe was, was successfully removed. This is the challenge, of course, Quill, is the uh, mother nature working against you. You know, when the weather is nice and warm, that's when water flows are highest, correct? As opposed to in the winter correct, yeah. when the weather is cold and very unfavorable, that's when the weather water levels are the lowest. And uh, so, so when you're talking about these toes, these are actual above water elements of the obstruction, and that doesn't even account for everything that fell into the water below, right? That's correct. So this toe, uh, when we were when Cute was drilling it, uh, the toe was was exposed because it was low water. So this drilling was happening through January, February, and March. The final blast happened in at, at Easter in April. So um, uh, what what happens with the with that blasting and with the removal of the toe? Uh, now that water has risen, uh, you're seeing the the benefits of that because there's a, a wider ch a channel for for the river flows through the the constricted area. Um, but you're right. I mean, at the same time, Kewitt was also, once they, they had established that road, they were in down at the slide site removing rock. They had rock trucks. They had large, uh, heavy excavators. And they were, they were also blasting rocks and boulders that uh, were in the way. So they were building uh, what we simply call fingers. There were, there were, yeah. there were these huge boulders in the mid-channel. Mid and uh, Kewitt built fingers out to these boulders and you know, blew up each one, um, one by one. Uh, I think one of the, the other major concerns in this area is the rockfall hazard. There is extreme rockfall hazard on the west side, and this was always an issue. Um, it was an issue for the incident commands teams in 2019, and it continues to be an issue. So scaling crews were involved. This, is, this means you're, again, you're 
repelling teams down yeah. the side of the cliff. You're removing rock. Uh, we uh, had a strong plan to install what's called a rock mesh canopy. So that would collect any rock that fell down to the west, the west, uh, the west area, the west bank of the of the river. And they also installed a, a, a very large uh, mesh, a carpet of, of chain link mesh at the top of the uh, the cliff there too. So that was to prevent any rock falls. But it's an ongoing problem. And um, it, yeah. And so, what's your sense of how the blasting actually worked? How effective was it in terms of opening up some fish passage? We noticed an improvement to the flows immediately after the blasting of the East Toe on, on uh, April 11th. Um, so that, that was a good indication that it was a you know, very positive operation, that all of that effort uh, will pay off. It will reduce flows through, through the area. Um, unfortunately, our data was also showing us all along that this, um, this slide was going to continue to cause problems for us into 2020. Uh, the sheer volume of material that landed in the river, uh, we're talking, you know, up to 80,000 cubic meters of rock landed in the river. And it, there's just not enough time um, uh, to get in there and remove it. Uh, even if we'd had many more months of low water, uh, it's still, uh, th this is a huge impediment to us. Well, we'll stop it there. That'll be our first segment of our conversation with Will Roberts. He's the director of the Big Bar Response Team for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Salmon Matter. We'll have a second part in this conversation with Will Roberts coming out shortly. Until then, thanks for joining Salmon Matter and stay well. <laughs>